Well, welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. I'm here with my all-time favorite Ninja Turtle, Leonardo Gonzalez. He's, he's shaking his head. He's shaking his head either in approval or disapproval. But Leonardo, tell me a little bit about yourself and if you want what you do professionally, man. Uh, it's all in approval. Um, professionally, I've been a comic book artist for a while now, probably seven years or more. Uh, just recently started tattooing at Clockwork Tattoo in Middletown, Connecticut. And I'm also been working at Walmart for like 15 years or some shit. That's just steady income, pays the bills. and Yeah, it's a job. I used to work at Walmart. I actually uh, left it just because, I mean, it wasn't for me. But I used to do this really guilty pleasure I still do when I go into Walmart now, even though it's been like five years since I worked there. And that's, I find like a candy. I don't know if you do this, like a nice Reese PCs. And I crush it in the package. And I just do that to the whole candy aisle. I mean, if you bought any candy from like June of like 2015, to like September of 2015, all that candy was fucked up because I would just sit there and crush it in the bag. Like my buddy, he always knows if he loses me in a grocery store to find me near the chip or marshmallow aisle because I'll just sit there, just crush one of them. I don't know what it is. It's just so soothing. I feel like if I can do that, life's going to be okay. You know, like uh, just, I don't know. So, yeah, we got a little things and little quirks that get us through life, and mine's crushing the shit out of a nice Reese pieces. Hey, man, you gotta do what you gotta do. Exactly. So I, when, I haven't really done anything weird like that, but <laughs> I, used to, uh, I used to just like sketch on like packaging, just like soda packaging or like candy or like potato chips, anything like that. I just grab a sharpie and like sketch a face on it or something. That's something. pretty cool. I mean, that'd be funny if you were sketching like dicks on packaging or something. Someone would be like, why is this on my lace chips? I've never heard of this flavor before. <laughs> yeah. that, that'd not be good. That wouldn't be good. So what exactly, uh, why'd you start, uh, first of all, even doing art? Like you said, drawing comic books in the first place, because that's actually some of my favorite illustrations are the ones you see in comic books. Well, I started, it was, it was a weird, uh, a weird thing. And, High school, I wanted to be a comic book artist, and then I just kind of kept going to school and doing all this stuff, and the art thing kind of changed, the focus changed, it went from wanting to do comics, to wanting to do fine art, to then wanting to do illustration, to then falling into comics again, and then now tattooing, so it's, it's, it just changes. What made you um, want to go from drawing on a piece of paper to drawing on somebody's skin? Uh, that just being burnt out with drawing on paper and doing things for other people, projects taking a really long time to complete and just a lot of back and forth. And it's just, I find it easier to just create something and put it on the skin and call it a day. Yeah. I, look, I, I mean, I look at art as, it's obviously in the eye of the beholder, but I feel like I never truly appreciated it until I got older when I was, went to an art museum and started looking at all the different, you know, types of strokes. I mean, I have a painting in my studio that's uh, Vincent Van Gogh's Starry Night and kind of looking at it and seeing all the, like kind of the brush strokes and all the different types of stylings I never truly got to see when I was a kid. I just looked at it and was like, oh, it's a cool night canvas painting, nice, wonderful sky, swirly colors. But as I'm looking at it, I can see the detail of the directions and the strokes of the way things go that now when I look at art pieces such as paintings and tattoos and the detail that goes in behind it, I've just completely changed my way of thought. I mean, it's true appreciation too. I mean, when you see people, they always talk about like when they get their first tattoo, it's always addictive. They start getting another one and then another one. The next thing you know, you got a sleeve or you got something covered. And I'm like, I don't know if I've ever come across anything where I felt so moved or so struck by anything to really get a tattoo of it on my skin. You know what I mean? Something that has found meaning yeah. to me. Yeah. Uh, yeah, art, art is something, I look at various different types of art, comic art, tattoo art, um, abstract art, like, it's just, it's all over the place. I, 
sculpture, anything really gets me going. Um, as far as like tattoo stuff goes, um, I ended up getting my first tattoo, I think a couple of years ago. And it was, and I, since I got that one, I understand why people get addicted to it. Um, just, just the pain. And if it's a tattoo that's meant to symbolize something or anything like that, that pain is just almost like therapy in a way. Yeah. Where do you come up with a lot of your inspiration for your art too? Because like looking through your Instagram profile, I mean, you have, what, what type of style would you call that? It's not like traditional uh, Japanese style. It's not traditional like anime or anything. It's more of like a, um, I, I don't know what I would say. There's a, uh, type of like 90s kind of weird um abstract punk art that uh my uncle does a tattoo styling of like you know giant hot rods with like these guys hanging out of them like kind of a little bit more like um I don't know what that style is called but you have like this cool like I guess trippy style to it a little bit of a psychedelic feature to it yeah I I, I don't know what the hell to call my style particularly i try to keep it as simple and as cheap as i can make it so i'm not like stressing out over gathering a bunch of reference materials and photographic models and getting the lighting perfect and all this other shit i just learned in school and i just don't really enjoy you know i want to keep it to where it's like if an average Joe, whatever, saw my drawing, it's like, I could probably do that. You know, yeah. just keeping it raw, keeping it professional, but also not really professional, like very punkish, grimy type of, I don't know what the hell to call it, really. Whimsical. I don't know. I feel That's, like school does definitely does the art program a disservice just because of the factors like, oh, you need to draw this line by taking this object and taking the circumference of this and then tracing it like that. I'm like, why can't I just put my pencil to the paper and free draw? Why does that have to be like for me in school, it was a specific time you could do a free draw part of the section where you could draw whatever you want. Everything's all about setting up and doing proper techniques and designs. I'm like, I've seen people that have never studied art before, never taken an art class and just learned to draw on their own and draw something that I could never do with the amount of techniques and teachings you could possibly do. I believe it's a gift people are obviously born with. And I had this uh, specific moment, this girl in my class who was like, she was a couple of years ahead. She was a senior. I was a freshman and I was just walking over and she always had this sketchbook and I was just like, what are you drawing? She's always all like covering it up and trying to make sure nobody would see it. And she flipped it open. I was like, just let me see it. You know, I'm a weird guy. So obviously I'm not, you know, I don't know what you're drawing, but I'm not going to be like, Hey, look at this person over here. I'm not going to point you out or anything. I just want to see I'm interested. She flipped it open and it was this giant chief Indian with like the giant headdress and he was smoking a peace pipe. And it was like a huge portrait that was in such detail. Like it looked like the Mona Lisa but in like a chieftain outfit. <laughs> and I was like, this is amazing. And she was like, let, let me look through her book, but she was so conservative of what her art was. And I'm like, this is someone who doesn't need a class for this. This is someone that it truly enjoys it. But I feel like a lot of what the world is now is it's got to be done like this. It's got to be done with these proper techniques. And like you're saying, so much goes into it. You end up losing the passion for it. Yeah. Um, there's, Yes and no to that. There's uh, you definitely have to learn technique and definitely have to learn process, color theory, um, how to use certain materials and how to really look at your work objectively. Because I know there's a lot of people that are artists and they draw and they think they're the shit, but then they're really not because they're just in that their own little bubble of ego. Ego, yeah. So I took it as a way as like, okay, yes, I can draw realistically. I can paint realistically. I can do still lifes and all that. I can copy a photo, but at the end of the day, it's just like doing that makes me want to kill myself. So <laughs> learning, learning how to construct something 
learning the ins and outs of it and then deconstructing it in your own way gives you another a, a better sense of it instead of just hacking away at something and, and, and trying to make it in, into something. Where did you start to realize you can actually draw? Like when was that moment you were like, I might actually be able to do this as a career or people are going to want to buy my art? Um, I never realized I, I could do it as a career. It was just something that made me happy. Um, I've been drawn since I was six, uh, watching my uncle and my aunts draw, asking me, you know, asking them to draw me stuff and copying that, and just doing that over and over again. And honestly, it's the only thing I've ever been good at. I've never been, it's, an, it's something that comes easily. I tried sports. I tried uh, wrestling, uh, basketball, football, baseball, and all that stuff just found me just hours of constant practice and not progressing as much as like, oh, let me just draw this and you know draw for an hour and seeing the amount of progress I made in my skill versus, oh, let me play basketball for 10 hours a week and still just being complete garbage so then it's like you know what i'm just gonna stick with this like a place you can fit in yeah and it's like i'm i'm i have natural talent here i can bust my ass in another field and just work you know a hundred times harder and it's just not evolving yeah. naturally not naturally happening so it's like it's, yeah this is not for me yeah clearly uh when do you uh, typically like, how do you find your inspiration for something? Like, I mean, I, I'll admit I'm a, I enjoy writing poetry for a lot of people. That's not a manly thing, but I think when I can be able to put pen to paper or something, you know, uh, nothing beats a nice firm pen. I'll go there. Zebra pens, shout out to them. I don't know if anybody out there works for them is listening, but the whole factor is their comfortability of the weight in the hand means something when it comes to writing something down or drawing something. And, uh, when I'm writing down poetry or something, I'm putting down words into a format, it's so simple and easy for me to do compared to if I was going to try football. That would be a lot more difficult, a lot more time. I'm a lot better. And it helps me reflect on a lot of things in life. You know, I, I need to be in a certain mindset when I do it, though. Usually it's pretty late at night or like two o'clock in the morning. I'm curious to where you come across a lot of your creation methods, a lot of your drawings. Do you have to set yourself out a certain time for it, or do you have to think upon an idea, or do you just put the pen to the paper and go? Uh, the way I approach it is I'm constantly doing it. I, I, I see that. I can, I can to the Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm doing it right now. Yeah. Sketching on a piece of paper. Pretty much constantly doing it, and eventually you'll hit something. You'll hit a stride. And then you'll ride that wave out for a little bit. And then you keep doing it again and over and over and over and over and over. There's no real like, oh, I can only do it when I'm in a good mood. If, you, if, if that's your approach to anything, you won't get anywhere. Oh, I'm only going to work out when I feel good. Oh, I'm only going to, you know, do this when the moon is full and the stars align. It's just, you're not going to get anywhere. It's just a constant repetition you feel like throwing up or you feel sick, it's like you just keep going. You just keep doing it over and over and over and over and over. And then you'll get some good ideas. You'll have like 10,000 bad ideas, but out of those 10,000, you'll have like a good 10 or 15 ideas or sketches or doodles or drawings that it's like, all right, that's worth posting. That's worth sharing. That's worth showing off. That's worth, this one's worth holding off to. It might mean a little more development and that's just it it's just that the daily i don't know grind you'd call it or the daily you just you gotta constantly do it what do you typically find to be the biggest issue that you come across do you ever experience writer's block uh yeah i used to experience that a lot and that usually meant that eventually after years of experiencing that over different time periods, it just meant that I had to take a break from drawing from my head or drawing things that I was comfortable with, stepping out of that and just trying something new. And um, I could, 
equated to like if you're working out with a certain weight set or something and you're just not seeing any progress. So you either got to go up and wait or try a different exercise and see how that reacts with your body. When you experienced the shift to doing tattoos on somebody's skin, what was that transition like? Like what, what made you decide to want to move from paper to somebody's like skin or something? Um, it's something that that was another thing I wanted to do in high school. Then I got out of it just because I started school and I wanted to get into the whole fine art thing. And I was with my teachers were like, I don't know if you should do tattooing or do fine art. You can pretty much go in both ways. And I tried the, the tattooing thing. And then I was just, the shops I had approached were full of people that have had big egos and just shitty ass work. You know, thinking they're the shit because, you know, oh, I'm doing tattoos and piercings and look at me. And it's like, yeah, dude, your work fucking sucks. It's like, you're not that good, but you you have dumb amount of money. And I just got out of that whole thing. And then the drama that goes into that whole fucking macho bullshit that's associated with that too. Yeah, it's pretty rough down here. We have a lot of people that are starting to make their own tattoos like out of their house or something, and they think they're the shit, and they start going yeah. off. And it's cool if you give a couple of tattoos, but they're nothing that you would see that someone would actually go and pay high dollar for. I mean, it's hard to – when we come to a creative skill like this, it's all just a giant competition. It's the same thing with podcasting. Everybody wants to bring their stuff up on top and be better than somebody else. And I'm like – just do what you fucking love and let your work show for itself. Like if you put in the hustle, you put in whatever grind, you put in whatever into whatever work you're creating, it's going to show for it. And people are going to see that you sit there and brag about everything that's going on for you and everything that you do and how amazing and talented you are when, you know, from another person's perspective, it's not, uh, it doesn't do anything for you. It actually just makes you inflate your own ego. And I think that's unneeded. Yeah, it's, it's, it's all it is. It's just take that energy and put it into something productive. It's like, oh, you're just wasting time and you're just wasting energy and, and resources. You're creating beef with other creators that is just unnecessary. and that You get nowhere. So I, I didn't want to go into that whole venue, into that whole world of you know, right out of high school, doing tattooing, thinking I'm the shit, and then my skills remaining exactly the same, or maybe progressing a little by the time I'm 30. I, you know, that's just something I, I didn't want. And it's like, you know, maybe I can fall back on this later, or maybe whatever. I don't really feel comfortable working on people's skin and, and dealing with, you know, fluids and all that. It's like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm just going to go into fine arts and I'm going to go into comics and see what what that holds and that was that and then I just came back full circle again to the tattooing just because I just felt bored and tired of where I was and just stagnant of just working and and with different projects uh not getting paid what I should be getting paid and then working on projects that never would get printed or made or created. It was like, like a, all right. I, like a severe waste of time when something doesn't get picked yeah. up or something. Yeah. It's like, oh, okay, cool. Um, I just worked on this title for four months and uh, the client's not going to publish it. So now I have nothing to show off for those four months. Okay. And I have some money that, I had to use because you know rent and bills and you got to fucking live so i just got fed up with that whole cycle of it's, stuff it, well it's easier probably to get money from a tattoo because you tattoo on somebody's skin and it's me it's like immediate payout you know what i mean but when yeah. you're when you're trying to do a process like a work of art or a comic book or something it's got to go through months of i guess development and all these other types of things and that's just at the hopes that it's going to get published i mean that's got to suck i mean how amazing it's got to be to first of all get your work in a comic book or get something published under a certain comic book artist i mean i'm always fascinated with how they are able to create these designs i mean when i was a kid uh, at my uh, elementary school they had these books that taught religion through comic book art 
and like they taught things like greek mythology all these other stories and stuff and it was so fucking fascinating to me that this was being able to get made is where i found the fascination with that but like you know it's hard to do something like this and get paid for it because anybody considers themselves an artist I mean, the fact is, I look at there's a lot of art, and obviously it means different things to everybody, comparing on what interpretation you want to make it. I don't know about the whole banana and duct tape onto a wall as being art when I can see people put in so many hours and so much hard work into a certain craft, and then somebody does something like that. It does seem a little bit lazy, but yeah. I mean, art is, I guess, in the eye of the beholder. Yeah, it, 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 you know, it might seem a bit lazy. I don't really judge it. I just think it's hilarious. I, I, it's like, that's funny. It's like, sure, take them for all their money. They were, fuck them. You want to pay for a banana on the fucking wall? I was like, fuck it, whatever. Yeah, $30 million for a banana yeah. on the wall. Good for you. I wish I thought of that. That's, that's genius, you know? That's, How well, much could I get paid for sticking a fork in a toaster? Yeah, it's, it's all how you analyze it and how you break it down. I guess, and how you sell it. It's all about figuring out a way to sell it to someone. Who knows? Would you say the biggest problem, I guess, would be in the industry in general of art, of how we look at it, or the fact of just, I guess, the people you have to work with? Because I feel like trying to do an art piece on a lot of things, it, usually if you're not doing it solo, it's a lot about who you're working with. It just seems like it gets difficult. Um. That I really have no fucking idea. That was a either yeah. good question or a bad question. I don't know. Yeah, that that I that I I, I don't really know. Well, even when you're doing your first uh, tattoo, switching over to that, what was your first experience like? Uh, finally, actually getting to put your art onto somebody. Oh, that, that was terrifying. It's, it still is, but once it's done, it's 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 really rewarding. Um, and I've been lucky that I've had all the t people I've tattooed, um, the majority of them, I would say like 98% of them have been fucking awesome and understanding and not fucking assholes. And, you know, there's always a few assholes here and there that don't really ruin it. They just give you a little thicker skin and no, then you just move on. Without hey. without mentioning a name, you know I'm gonna ask who these assholes were and what why were they assholes? Oh man. Um either they come they don't want to pay for the work that you put into something. You know, they'll they'll want a they'll want a big uh leg piece or something and expect it's fifty bucks. You know, and it's like, dude, it's it's like I have to draw this thing out, I have to outline it, I have to fill it, you know, we gotta figure out the colors, uh, we gotta lay the stencil on you. It's it's a whole process. It's not just like I'm gonna do it for fifty bucks. It's like, yeah, I'm an apprentice, but you're getting something. Yeah, I'm getting some practice, but mostly you're gonna get a pretty decent sized tattoo and a pretty decent looking tattoo. And it's not going to be 50 bucks. Like, it's not happening. Yeah, if you want $50 work, you should go to a place that gives $50 work, not something that gives a little bit higher dollar. I think people also have a problem. Like, if you get if you get a tattoo and then complain about the payment and not want to pay for it after it is done, that's like eating a meal and then complaining that it didn't taste good. Yeah, so the, why, why the fuck should you eat it? It's like, oh, I didn't want, either I didn't want it this big or I didn't want to look like that. or I didn't. It's like every step of the way, you know, I asked you, is this good enough? Do you want it to be like this? Do you want it a little bigger? And then once it's done, it's just, it's just, you know, you just, there's assholes everywhere. Do you and try and is, do, well, do you try and do your own style of art onto somebody or do you let them pick and give them, or do you try like, I know people pick out templates, people pick out different options and then the tattoo artist usually has to copy it and just do that or something. Or do you try and ask them what they want and make your own version or interpretation of that? Um, usually I get asked to do something in my style. I mean, I'll tattoo whatever the hell you want, you know, to, to an extent. You know, I'm not going to start tattooing swastikas on foreheads and shit. I'm not doing that. But there's, uh, you know, it's just, you want, all right, this is, you might find something on Pinterest 
And I was like, oh, I want this tattoo. I was like, all right, do you want this exact one or you want me to kind of tweak it for you? Do you want me to draw it in my own way? What do you want? And I kind of work with everyone like that. And, you know, there's some, a lot of them let me do what I do. And there's just some that just, they just want what they want. What's on that printout from Pinterest or wherever, whatever the fuck. And it's like, okay, that's okay too. That's fine. I'm not gonna, it is what it is. At the end of the day, it's, it's I get practice, I get paid. And that's on your leg or on your arm. And I never get to see you again. Or maybe I do. What's one tattoo that you hate tattooing on people? Is it the, is it the Chinese symbols? No, those, those are actually fun. Um, what? You like doing Chinese symbols on people? Those, those are fun. They're, they're, they're good practice. I don't know. Usually I ask them what they mean and we kind of figure out. I've done a, a few of those. Or it's like, oh, this means love. This means, you know, usually like I've done a lot of Japanese kanji. Um, but it is what it is. It's like, it's, it's your, it's cheesy. It's corny. It's just like the infinity symbol. It's like, that's just fucking garbage. Live, laugh, love. I know that's fucking garbage, but people like that stuff and fuck it. You know, have you ever, um, had to come across or do any type of comic book style tattoos onto somebody? Like, I mean, I know pop culture and all these types of things are very, very popular in uh tattoo industries. Like people want to get pickle rick or they want to get rick and morty or they want to get pokemon or something on their arm especially yeah. kids these days yeah I've, I've, I've done a few of those those are fun and that's the kind of stuff i like doing it's like all right cool you want a pokemon fucking awesome let's go well who's your favorite yeah. pokemon oh man i've got a uh, squirtle and bulbasaur you pick Squ okay who would you pick if you're going to pick a starter though Oh, that's a tough one. I always pick Squirtle. All right. Same here. Yeah. Me and my buddy get into a confrontation. He's like, why wouldn't you pick Bulbasaur? I'm like, because he turns into a giant freaking sized plant at the ending that does not look very appealing to a lot of people's eyes, I would say. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's pretty cool. But I always go with Squirtle. I just, I really like that evolution set. Yeah. So, would you say a lot of your influences for like a lot of your art designs besides like just coming kind of across them and stuff but also like stuff we were saying before like we were mentioning with your name leonardo like the ninja turtles i mean a lot of that stuff comes from like those 80s or 90s types tv shows i mean johnny bravo a lot of those things influence a lot of things that i'm super interested in i mean you'll find that with older generations obviously it seems like people that are in their 30s or 40s right now are more interested in stuff that having to do with like american flags or being kind of not would say redneckish but more of like manly type things if we want to consider guns and eagles and all these other type things and then oh, you're, you're you're describing chad culture yeah the chads yeah um i don't know i just i just always liked cartoons coloring books shit like that i've never i've never been super i don't know i don't want to get fucking into well some... it makes it easier and relatable to get, do something you're interested in right if you're sitting down and doing a tattoo if i asked you to give me a tattoo of squirtle you're gonna have a lot more fun than if i asked you to give me a tattoo of like uh i don't know a fruit or something unless you did it in a cool way or whatever yeah, but. yeah you always got to find your your approach to something um you can't just immediately go it's like oh i kind of want to fucking do this this is an appeal to me i'm not gonna fucking do this you always have to find your your twist on it your way to approach something you can't immediately just block it off because then no one's gonna have fun the client's not gonna have fun you're not gonna make money you're not gonna get a portfolio piece you're not gonna get better at what you do so you remain open as as much as you can you know like uh, there was a joke that one of my friends um he wanted uh to get trump tattooed on him and i was like fuck it i don't care like i don't give a shit i'll, I'll tattoo the word trump on you that's fine i always I look care. at because um talking through a few people that are in the tattoo industry and they talk about kind of the way of the old style of thinking when it comes to tattoo artists a lot of older guys that really aren't 
you know, they've been doing it for so many years and they kind of have this highbrow look at things, especially when newer people are trying to enter the industry. Uh, coming from a couple girl tattoo artist perspectives that have had a hard time getting a job there because of the way those guys type think. I look at it like if I had the ability to be a tattoo artist or I had the ability to draw, I think one of the most important things not only is working in an amazing environment, which is probably got to be difficult to find. I mean, it's like that with any job, but also the communication aspect you get with your clients. I mean, you're like a bartender. You're not only listening to somebody's stories and having conversations, but you're, I guess, engaging in something that's pretty intimate. I mean, you're giving them uh, basically it you know, an injection or a tattoo of an art on their leg or their arm or something. And, you know, you, you want to be warmed up to the conversation. Do you want music? Do you not want music? Do you want to talk? Do you want to be silent? I mean, you've probably come across some stories or have some pretty good conversations with people that really kind of make the experience overall amazing. Yeah, no, definitely. And just the people that, you know, we just start talking and it'll go off into video games or go off into their family or their dog or whatever it is. And in many ways it's therapeutic for me because I, I get to learn a little something and connect with my client. And then they also get to vent out and kind of relax and chill and just zen out and get tattooed, get their piece of art for whatever it is that they want to remember or could just be decorative it, it, you know there's there's many different uses for a tattoo um it's enjoyable it's about providing a service and just being genuine i i don't like phoniness at all that phoniness you can immediately read it um i don't have the qualities of you know like a fucking waitress or something or someone that works in customer service oh how may i help you blah 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 and it's like i don't i don't that's, that's not me i get it it's that i always talk about i actually uh made a joke out of it was um people that complain about wearing a mask i'm like why are you complaining about wearing a mask when you've worn one your whole entire life basically i mean we walk around in public uh and, you know we put on these false personas we don't really try and truly be ourselves yeah. and i think as a tattoo artist you see the vulnerable side of people you get to see that realness of it because you can come in with this false confidence this fake act this fake perspective and once that needle hits the skin and you start to feel that pain or something you know you, you drop that uh you drop that guard you become pretty vulnerable to people i know uh yeah. it's best to be real in a lot of situations it's hard to get that you know you see it with people that try superfood challenges like chili eating contests where they're crying on the ground and being really emotional is because of the fact they're in pain it has to bring them to that state of mind and i'm like you come across so many people that don't want to be themselves and i look at that like you don't want to be yourself because you're not happy with who you are but why don't you just learn to love your flaws you know what i mean i feel like we already are judged so much as a society that we don't even get to truly be ourselves i mean if i say something stupid in a podcast it's fucking out there i'm not gonna hide it you know yeah. it's um i feel like yeah. too much we we boast in public and cry in private yeah that's that's the other thing it's being afraid to have an opinion or say something and then you know months later it's it'll come and bite you in the ass for, you know, and it's like, that's stupid. It's, it's whatever. It is what it is. I, with the people I work with, you know, getting tattooed, they start talking. If they don't start talking, they don't talk. And it's like, I don't care. It can go either way. I'm still going to try my best to give you a good product at the end, whether or not you come back or not, whether or not I want to work on you again or not. That's, Maybe. Well, besides the, the, besides the guy that cut you out on the tattoo or maybe the complaint about the price, have you ever had anybody that you won't tattoo again just because it was a terrible experience? Um, I've had people who have tattooed that are a terrible experience. And once I get done tattooing them, it's like, oh, I don't want to tattoo them again. And then they'll hit me up on Messenger or Instagram. And then, you know, I'll schedule them again for another appointment just because it just... One, I don't like to say no. And two, I like to experience just different types of things. You know, it might, it might have been, I might have been tattooing you. You might have had a horrible day. And then you might have taken out, on, it might have gone differently. Maybe the second time it'll be a little different. Maybe the third time it won't. I don't know. 
it's also money. Yeah. So you know, it's a it's a business. You're not there to just make friends. You're also there to make a living and provide a service. And it's got to be it's got to be good always. And I'm also it's not my studio. You know, I'm representing Clockwork Tattoo, and I have you know there's there's a certain obligation you have you can't just shit on customers just because you want you don't feel like doing something just because this piece doesn't appeal to your ego it's no it's like all right they're in here you do the service you get them out the door and hopefully they come back yeah plus it brings in more clientele when they're showing off your tattoo it's a representation not only of your business but you as a person you as an artist you sit there and do a shitty job people are gonna be like you see this crappy tattoo i got from this but if you do an amazing job you do the best of your ability people are going to show that off and that only brings you more attention yeah it's like it's more attention for me more attention for the shop and that's always good that's, have you ever, that's, ha, well have you ever had a tattoo that somebody had to explain to you what it was or explain to you why do you want this i mean i always look at somebody that has like why do you have a barcode on your wrist what does that mean and then they give you like some deep meaning behind it uh no usually the only people who I bust their balls on stuff, it's usually family members or like friends of family members that I know that I, I kind of like rank on them and I kind of make fun of their tattoo in a, not in a serious way, just cause that's just how I am with people that I know. And that's just how I socialize with people. It's like, you know, yeah, I'm calling you this or that or making fun of whatever the hell, but yeah, well, I'm just it trying. breaks it yeah. breaks the tension in the room. I mean, you're sitting there tattooing people. I always always talk to my my uncle when he's tattooing. He's like, I try my best to break that tension in there because you know how awkward it is doing like a six hour tattoo and nobody's talking and all you're hearing is deep breathing. They don't want any music playing or anything. You know how awkward that is. I'm like, yeah, it's like being in an elevator and it gets stuck and you just sit there for two hours not talking to the person that's stuck in there with you. Yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, that's that's rough. But, you know, you always find a way, a little joke, a little this, a little that, you know, something meaningful, something that's, I don't know. As, as soon as I hear the, the weather conversation coming, it's like, oh, fuck this. I'm shutting off. I'm not responding. I, I don't fucking care about the weather. It's like, yeah, okay, yeah, the fucking sun is out. What, what the hell do you want from me? Well, shit, dude, it's an autopilot answer. It's the same thing I hate, too, yeah. when I'm walking into a store or something and somebody immediately goes, hey, how's it going? And they keep on walking. I'm like, that. I'm not even going to respond to that. You're not even listening. You're just saying something just to say something. Like, it's a normal thing to do. It's these autopilot responses we give off. Yeah, it's, just, it's too robotic. And it's like, when it gets to that, it's like, I don't want to talk to you. If I'm talking, I rarely don't talk, but if I am talking, it's usually something, all right, I'm talking for a reason. I'm not talking just to fucking hear your, your face sounds. I don't, I don't care. Your face sounds. Well, I mean, it means down to a point, dude. And I think it's pretty important, like um, getting your art there, not only with tattoos as well, but the way that uh, social media has kind of went. I mean, your Instagram, for instance, you got a lot of people that follow you, a lot of people that enjoy your art. I mean, that's got to be an amazing feeling when you put up a work and you get to see people respond to it in such a positive way. Yeah, no, that's fun. Um, where all those followers came from, I have no idea. When I started, I had maybe a few hundred, and that was a struggle. And then I just took off. I don't even, I still don't know what to even do with that. But it's awesome. It, it definitely feels good. It definitely feels like I'm doing something right. And that's all I can really do. Just keep doing what I'm doing. Yeah. I mean, I I mean it, wor it works, dude. I came across it and I was looking at it and. I think I came across the, I think, oh man, I can't remember if it was the fly one. Oh, that was your logo. I came across there. I You got to explain this picture. So it's, you said it's a punk mermaid. The punk mermaid. Was that the green one? Yeah. The one the green, yeah, yeah. Where the hell did you get that inspiration from? That I was listening to the misfits while drawing my mermaids and usually i usually get stuck on like an album for a while like i'll just sit with it for a while and just keep listening to it over and over and over and over and over and it was the uh where is the shit 
and I can never remember the song names or the album name ever for any fucking band. Let's see. Static Age. That was the one from 96, The Misfits. And I've just been playing that album over and over again. And then, I don't know, just came up with that version of that mermaid through that. Yes. And again, it's it's not influenced by them, but it's just the constant repetition of drawing on drawing and drawing and drawing and drawing. You, you know, you draw one and it's like, oh, this is shit. You draw another one. Oh, this is a little better. You draw this one. Oh, I could take elements from this one, the third one and the fourth one and maybe combine them into something a little different. And it's like, okay, that one really works. And then that's the approach that I take. Any particular albums you get stuck on, like you just listen to, besides maybe one that you just get recently over and over and over again, but anyone that you kind of fall back to, maybe something that helped you in the past or something like for me, if I listen to Green Day, it reminds me of all the times I was a kid during those teenage angst years or you're singing in the closet or something. Wake me up when September ends, you know, something like that. Like, is there anything in particular? It's a good album. Um I'd have to say, I think three of the albums I listened to the most, Master of Puppets, the Metallica. Uh, what was the other one? Master of Puppets, Megadeth, Rust in Peace. There's a uh, Venus Doom by him. And some other the white stripes. I can listen to the fucking white stripes all day. All day. You like the song just, doorbell? Just the yeah, just I don't know. It's just the fucking the drumming. I just really focus on the drumming and just. My parents are uh, DJs and they're also radio broadcasters, so I had a wide variety of music growing up. And I remember when I discovered the white stripes, and I was listening to doorbell. And my dad just walks by. Like it was the time when we only had one computer in the house. So it was sitting in the middle of the family room. So you're basically bugging the shit out of everybody. He just walks by. He goes, yeah. Is that the fucking white stripes? I'm like, I'm thinking about the doll bell when you're going to ring it. He's like, No freaking way this is happening right now. <laughs> yeah, it's it's fucking good. You know, some some songs just get stuck with you. And some albums get stuck with you over and over again. It's and it's not even, well, saying, it's, it's the same thing with me and Kiss. My first comic book I ever read was a Kiss comic book. My dad's a giant Kiss fan, so he had the giant book that was made. Their ink was made with uh, at least the first hundred copies were made with the band's blood. Um, the so my dad got that comic book, uh, Kiss Meets the Phantom at the Park, and just went off on and showed me. And I'm like, well, who is this band? He's like, you don't know who Kiss is? I'm like, no. And I mean, this is my dad's, I, like my dad was in a Kiss tribute band. So he dressed up as Peter Chris and went on stage. And that's how I knew my dad is the cat man. So him not giving me that information until I was like 10 years old was him letting the world down that his son didn't know who kiss was. So it was very interesting for me to be able to see that. I mean, he was, he got a tattoo on the radio. So he's sitting there in a live broadcast. And this is back when tattoos took fucking forever, not as fast as they were today, but he has the kiss um, where all their heads are in a circle and they're all doing that's I think of the rock and roll all night or the greatest hits um, cover. And he has that right on his arm. And he talked about giving, getting it on the radio, like trying not to say the F word on live broadcasting because of him getting basically injected. Like, oh, this coming up, you're listening to holy, like, you know, he's like doing that type yeah. of thing. And I think that's amazing. Uh, that's why I, I think that's pretty interesting that, you, have, you know, you're listening to a work of art. You can pull an inspiration from it. Cause like the same thing when I see a static TV, I immediately thought of the name for my podcast, like out of the blank, just that static I don't know. It's just because yeah. you don't know where it can go. You don't know what's going to come on next. Yeah, I don't even think. Does that even still happen? They called it snow back in the day, but I'm pretty sure it doesn't happen unless your whole service goes out. But if you have yeah. Mediacom, it's shit, and it goes out a lot. <laughs> oh, man. Well, you know, I really appreciate you at least coming out and doing the podcast, man. I, I think your artwork's amazing. Um Thanks. 
you probably get it all the time, but I'm still going to say it because it is, I really love a lot of the designs on there. And I really am thankful that you took the time to come out and do the podcast, man. No, um, Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. I mean, I'm, I'm thankful that you reached out and wanted to have me on here. This is, it's fun. Now, is I mean, there anything I mean, besides, I mean, well, is there anything besides master of puppets you want to plug like your Instagram page? Uh, I wish I knew the name of my Instagram page. Do you want, do you want me to read it off? I'll link it down there too, but I'm gonna read it off. It's going to be L A G O N Z A R T. So Laganza art. Yeah. Laganza. That's usually what I go by. That was just like a, a, a joke. My buddy came up with. He was, he was just like, come up with that. And then people won't know what the hell it is. I was like, all right, cool. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to commission you for a sloth eating a pop tart. Sloth eating a pop. That's two of my favorite things. Either that or a hot pot. No, a sloth eating a taquito. Yeah. Sloth eating a taquito. Sounds like a plan. It's my spirit animal. What's your spirit animal? My spirit animal? Uh, it would have to be a turtle. Um, it's a weird story thing. Um, I was going through a period of just like months of having these weird nightmares where I'd have a baby turtle that would be starving to death because I would forget to feed it. <laughs> it's a fucking hor horrible fucking thing every fucking night and then I ended up stealing a turtle from the mall pet store which is a fucking shitty ass pet store anyway fuck that pet store fuck the mall and then that's when the those nightmares stopped so then I figured it's like oh I guess that's, that's your spirit that's your spirit animal stole, yeah. how, how how much trouble would I get in if I stole a sloth probably a lot um they live to be like 40 something years old yeah i know the care is definitely not the easiest it can't be no they're, they literally move so slow that algae grows on their fur yeah you, you'd have to replicate their environment why does life have to be so damn difficult can i just own a sloth and then that's it yeah i mean i wanted an alligator but clearly have you been to Florida? Yeah. yeah. You, you still want an alligator? Pretty scary, yeah. I watched a video of a dude on a motorcycle hit an alligator like a speed bump and fly right over the handlebars. I did laugh, but that's a fucking dinosaur. Yeah, that thing will fucking kill you. That, that's not even... That, that shit is scary. Like, I, thinking about it, and it's like, oh, yeah, it'd be cool to have, but actually owning one, like a... Uh, like a fucking tiger or a lion or something. That's just nuts, man. I I was listening to these uh, 911 calls on YouTube. Sometimes I just get just finding different inspiration, listening to scary stories and shit like that, just to keep my brain busy while I draw. And listening to the 911 call when that chimp ripped off that lady's face. Oh, Jesus. A few years ago. And it's like, yeah, this is not my channel. This is, I'm not watching this ever again or listening to this. It was just scary. You just... I, heard, I heard one 911 call where a guy pushed this girl down a flight of stairs and he said it was an accident. Oh, and like God. you could hear in the 911 call how the woman was asking him questions like, just send the cops. Why are you waiting? And she's like, they're already are dispatched. I'm just being on the phone and trying to figure out the situation. And he's like, she just fell down the stairs. And then later he like got, I guess she twisted it around and he admitted to doing it himself and yeah that was some scary shit i was wondering like because my buddy is a, a dispatcher for the police and she, uh, she does a few things uh when it comes to you know weird calls that she handles and i was wondering how to get in that and she was like you could never handle it she goes because the amount of shit you would hear you can't, you can't be having conversations all the time with these people. I'm like, Oh, that's like the worst thing is once you get me on the phone, I just start going. Yeah, no, there's the one that played before that monkey one was, uh, this lady 
took her daughters to some random ass house in the middle of nowhere and fucking stabbed them. And then she was on the phone with, with the dispatcher. It's like, yeah, I just stabbed my kids. You know, can you guys send the police? And it's like, what the fuck? This is, I can't hit, there's no way I could do that job. There's no way I could do dispatching. There's no way I could be a police officer. There's no way. The craziest it's, story I think I've ever heard from like a paramedic was I had a long time ago, Josh Huggins. Um, this guy's a paramedic. He's like, the worst call I've ever been on was a knife stabbing. And they get there, and he's an EMT, and it wasn't a knife that stabbed him, but the way the dispatcher described it was a knife wound. The dude got stabbed with a fucking samurai sword. Oh, my God. Like, went all the way through and out the other side. He's like, that's not a fucking knife wound. That is a samurai sword wound. That's a whole nother code that gets put in the book. And I'm like, that would be the mistake I make. Someone's like, I am having a fire or there's a fire. And I'm like, okay, it's a small house fire. Next thing you know, it's like an apartment complex that's burning down and Adam Sandler's throwing cats out windows. Yeah, it's it's a rough job, man. It's it, it takes a special person to to do that. I don't know how that lady just didn't break down and but it's just scary listening to the person that committed the crime just calm as day or flip out and, and completely change as if something else had possessed them and, and, and done the killing or the stabbing or it's scary. Well, I'm glad uh, we could wrap up the podcast with death and murder. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening to this episode of out of the blank podcast and stay tuned for our next episode where we're going to talk not only about death and murder, but also what it takes to make a nice souffle. Ooh.